You are now listening to the Visit El Paso podcast, official podcast of Destination El Paso. I'm your host, Christy Couture, and this is episode 10, the History Vault for February 2014. Thanks for listening to the Visit El Paso podcast. This is the flagship episode of our History Vault series, which we'll be introducing each month right after our main podcast. The goal of this series is to give you some additional insight into the interesting past of El Paso and show you the amazing heritage and living history that you can find here. In this episode, we'll be chatting with Jackson Polk, a very involved and prolific history journalist who's one of our go-to experts when it comes to just about anything in El Paso's past. He hosts the El Paso History Radio Show every Saturday morning from 10 a.m. to noon on KTSM AM 690 and has a wealth of historic information on his two websites, ephistory.com and elpasogold.com, so make sure to check those two out. In this interview, Jackson gives us the best and most concise overview of El Paso's history that I've ever heard, and gives us some insight on what he thinks was the most pivotal moment in our history. My name is Jackson Polk. I'm a television and radio producer. I focus on El Paso history and the heritage of the town and the area. And I'm finding out that by producing TV programs and radio shows about El Paso, we're finding out a lot of interesting things about El Paso that not everyone knows. And so one of my missions in life is to help explain this information to anybody who wants to hear it, including locals and uh, anybody from way out there who uh, has a radio or a DVD that they that they got from us. So they'll hear what El Paso is all about. That's an excellent mission. And I know that your show is a local favorite. And uh, the upcoming Heritage Tourism Symposium, which will happen on March 22nd, is, is going to be a big deal for our region. Um, on a broader scale, uh, I suppose as a society as a whole, why do you feel that the preservation of history and heritage is such an important part of humanity? Well, it's always a good idea to remember where you've been. Helps you make uh, less mistakes in the future, but that's just a general statement. First of all, the radio program we do is, is gone international. It's online, and we're starting to get calls and, and uh, emails from all over the planet. So El Paso is being put on the map in a different way without without much ex- really extra effort. We're doing the same radio show we've done for years, and now it's getting out there further. So that's a difference with the technology. We're also embracing the technology quite a bit when we can. And we're using social media to help people find the radio program. And we're using the radio program to help people find uh, other interesting things on social media. So as far as like, why is the history important, it's a pretty much uh, understood fact that if you uh, don't understand your history, you're bound to repeat it. And in our case, uh, we, have, we have great history in El Paso. And, and the idea of what we do on the radio program, the TV broadcast, is simply make people aware that there is such great heritage and history in El Paso. See, El Paso is a crossroads, and it's one of those unique places in the United States and actually in North America that has had so much traffic go through it. And a lot of the people on their way through decided to stop and stay, and that's who most of us are. We managed to get through the desert here. Our families did way back. We're still here, and then we wake up and look around and see what's going on and find out, hey, we're kind of unique. Learning the heritage and history shows you who you are and where you've been, and also it gives a bit of pride to people. They realize, oh, we did some cool stuff. That's true, and, you know, I'd like to touch a little bit on the different types of cultures that pass through El Paso, maybe a few of the uh, different heritages that have contributed to the fabric of our existing culture now. I know the Spaniards came by here, um, you know, and and this area was full of indigenous people. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about that? El Paso has been inhabited for thousands of years, and there's proof of that in one of our major ancient historic attractions, that's the Keystone Heritage Park. That's on the west side of El Paso. It's right on the river, and it's situated there where a big draw comes down from the Franklin Mountains. So in the old days, you could bet that would be where game would come by, or certainly water would come by, and Mm -hmm. therefore game, and as people put their houses there. Uh, About 40 years ago, 50 years ago, some people found that location and dug it up and looked at well, in, in a sort of a forensic fashion with anthropologists and archaeologists, what is all this? And they figured out 
that the oldest people to live in El Paso that have been recorded and, and, and are discernible are right mm-hmm. there on Donathan Drive in El Paso, and it is at least 5,000 years old. And you look at that wow. timeline, you realize they were still building pyramids in Egypt at the same time El Paso had a village here. So mm-hmm. you can look at El Paso from a number of angles, but when you look at the old stuff, we rank right up there. We, we just have never had the publicity like an Egypt has because we don't have the, our, our people didn't leave uh, pyramids. They left uh, mud huts that are you know broken and crashed under the ground. But when you go dig them up and forensically look at them, you can figure out that is what that was. So we have a claim to fame in the El Paso Valley here that's as old as the pyramids in Egypt. You begin there. Then coming forward, there are indigenous people that were here for hundreds and hundreds of years. We, they left evidence. They're all over the place. And you, we find that out by one interesting major asset that El Paso has, and that's the El Paso Archaeological Museum. Very few people have as much archaeology as we do, and so they normally in their cities don't need a museum just for archaeology. But El Paso has such a vast history in the old days, and it's been preserved, because in these dry deserts, human things quite often maintain for, for many, many years. So the El Paso Museum of Archaeology is a treasure to come look at. It's situated on the, on the edge of the Franklin Mountains, beautiful backdrop for everything uh, um, interesting and outdoors about El Paso, and that's where the archaeology is. It's all over the place out there. And as we study what the ancient peoples did, we come forward to find that there were what we now term Native American Indians living in the El Paso, Juarez, Rio Grande Valley, uh, Mm -hmm. when the first Europeans rolled in. And see, the first Europeans who rolled in were the ones who have recorded the history. The ancient Indians did record some things, but they recorded those usually in petroglyphs or pictographs on walls in caves, or in our case, uh, in Waco tanks, spelled H-U-E-C-O. And Waco Mm -hmm. tanks is another ancient repository of information. That is, that is way back there old. It goes back to the archaic period, at least 10,000 years. So El Paso has a foundation in ancient human history. And coming forward from that, you then come, when the Europeans did show up in the uh, late 1500s, several expeditions mm-hmm. came through El Paso to see what was going on. Then a major expedition and colonization group came through in 1598 that was led by Don Juan de Oñate, and he led a whole bunch of soldiers, settlers, colonists, and I think about 7,000 head of livestock that came with them that would be their, their future food and future farming uh, uh, items that they would, they would need, need to continue their life. And so they showed up in 1598 in a large caravan. They came out of Zacatecas, Mexico, and they, they were very thankful when they got to the Rio Grande and found water because by then they'd been through the desert for several days. Darn near killed all of them at could have. And as it turned out, they managed to get to the Rio Grande. They were very thankful. They had a mass, which is unto itself a Thanksgiving. So some people are claiming we had one of the earliest Thanksgivings in North America, which actually mm. is true. Oh. It happened in, in one of our neighborhoods here. So um, is that sort of what you want to hear? Yes, indeed. Uh, here we go. We keep going because when Onyati rolled in, they, they stayed in the El Paso area for a couple of weeks at max. Because they were, they, like I say, they had almost not made it across the desert, so they replenished with water. They had game they could uh, could catch and uh, catch the fish. In other words, they replenished themselves and headed up river, because that was their original plan, was to go through what is now El Paso and end up in northern New Mexico, where there were many, many pueblos of Indians, Native Americans, that they thought they could go up there and uh, Christianize them, turn them into taxpayers, and create another colony for the king of Spain. Mm-hmm. which is pretty much what they did. But as they came through El Paso, one of the major things they did was that Thanksgiving. But another one they did was to name the city. And the city is now called El Paso due to something that they said when they crossed the river. They named the crossing in the river El Paso del Rio del Norte. In other words, the ford or the passage or the way to get across the river in this big river, uh, and it's at, and it's at the, the pass. So they were passing across the river and named it, but people think it meant the mountain pass, which it really mm-hmm. it didn't. It's the, it's the crossing of the river. So yeah, Onyati it called it that. And one reason that Onyati was so successful in, in what we know about him is mm-hmm. because he, he brought a reporter. He had a guy write it all down. And so that, that diary, that, uh, that full journal is available to read and see exactly what they did. And that's how we know what they did. And that's why the Spanish are different because they were chroniclers of their of their efforts. They 
wrote it down. We can now know what they did. And, and, and before that, many of the efforts um, people explored, they were, they were writing down some of their stuff. And, of course, the Native Americans who were here didn't have much of a written language at all. So what we know about our history comes from the Spaniards. And what they did by coming through the valley of Juarez and El Paso, because we have to look at this as one valley. And in the Juarez El Paso Valley, they created a path that was then followed by many, many people up and down the Rio Grande for many years. They created the Camino Real, which is a royal road, meaning that the King of Spain declares he owns it. Now, you might find a Native American or two who would disagree with that. But at the time, they had better weapons, and so their thought prevailed. That's why the Spaniards won. They could do what they wanted. They could subjugate the locals, and pretty much did. And turned a lot of them into Christians and the Catholics, basically, because they, when the Spaniards showed up, the one religious thing they brought with them was the Catholic Church. And so the Spaniards would then create a situation where they were going to save the souls and put them to work for the King of Spain. And that's what they did all up and down the Camino Real. So that's the early history of El Paso. That began everything that we are now. And the Spaniards also created missions. Now, a mission is a, an area of uh, where a priest serves the people. It is also a physical building. And so they left some missions here in Guadalupe in 1659. And that was going to be like the main mission in the area. Since it's on the river, it's sort of a waypoint as they're on the Camino Real with their caravans and they replenish their supplies and move on. Then something happened in 1680 that changed the equation around here big time. The Indian yeah. Native Americans in northern New Mexico revolted against the Spanish rule and basically rose up and, and killed a whole bunch of Spaniards, kicked the rest of them out. The Spaniards tried to make a deal, and they were allowed, because the Indians at that point began and gained control of all of northern New Mexico and told the Spaniards to get lost. And so to get, getting out of there, the Spaniards had only one way to go, and that was south to El Paso. El Paso del Rio del Norte was their next large location of any size for any refuge. So they got out of, they got out of uh, northern New Mexico as quickly as they could, and they coerced, forced, or talked into several uh, hundred Tigua Indians to come with them. T-I-G-U-A is how it's spelled now. It's pronounced Tiwa, T-E-W-A, by the mm -hmm. original natives. So the Tiwa Indians came with them to El Paso, and, and also they picked up another tribe called the Piros, P-I-R-O. And as the Spaniards came south back to El Paso, they brought these people with them. At that point in 1680, they established missions for these Indians down the Rio Grande, further south from the Guadalupe Mission in the central part of the valley in uh, now what is what is. So down toward what is now Isleta and Socorro, they established locations for these Indians to live and ultimately built them buildings, which were then called missions. We still have all of this history here now, and we still have all of these people and all these tribes. So as you look at modern-day El Paso and you figure out where did all these people come from, that's the major start of populating the valley. There were Piro, no, excuse me, there were um, some Indians here, the Mansos, and there were some other uh, small tribes in the El Paso Valley when the Spaniards arrived. But on the 1680 revolt, revolt, when they all came back down the trail with another couple of tribes, that's when El Paso, Del Rio, Del Norte really began to, to be a bigger entity. It was a much bigger location. So that begins, that little story there begins what is El Paso, Texas. It's amazing. So much living history is still uh, very evident in El Paso, not only with Keystone and, and Leco Tanks and, of course, the missions and the chapel, and what are some ways that you think we can take advantage of this living history that we have here in El Paso? Well, heritage tourism is an interesting uh, subject all by itself. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you yourself, anybody can be a heritage tourist. I mean, I'd like to go see some, some of the uh, museums and visit some of the locations, let's say, in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. So mm -hmm. I would be a heritage tourist if I left El Paso and went up, went up there to see uh, Mount Vernon, the United States Capitol, I want to see the heritage of where things began. Well, the same is true about El Paso, Texas. We have historic assets that are on a world-class level. The, mm -hmm. the Mexican Revolution that occurred here in the early 1900s, that preceded the Russian Revolution. So on a world stage, the area here sort of saw that big thing happen before it happened in Russia. So there's a lot of things like that. So if you want to come to El Paso 
and see remnants of the Mexican Revolution, there are many places you can go and many artifacts you can see that are, that are left over from that. The same with any other heritage tourism. El Paso's history with the, with the Catholic diocese here and with the Oñate expedition, there are remnants of that all over the place in, in the faces of the people because a lot of the people here are descendants of those Spaniards. So also there's a lot of history to go look at in the missions themselves. The Guadalupe Mission in Juarez is still there. You can take a look mm-hmm. at that. The Yesada Mission in Yesada, Texas is there. You can go mm-hmm. through and see the history there. They have a really nice uh, cultural center that Tiwa Indians do. <clears throat> Pardon me. And also go further down the mission trail to Socorro, and you will see another mission there that was established the next day. So it's almost just as old as the first mission. And that is a fabulous old building with a lot of history. And go further down the mission trail to uh, the Presidio Chapel of San Elizario, and that has a museum there. And it's also a little plaza, which is turning into an arts district. So there's a lot to see and do here. So when you want to come see our heritage, the major difference in my, in my talking about Washington, D.C. tourism and El Paso, Texas tourism, is that everybody knows about the Washington, D.C. locations. They don't know about El Paso. So our job here is to explain that. And I think <clears throat> that's the main thing of this summit. One reason we wanted to organize the, the first El Paso History Summit in 2013 was that we were looking at the whole subject matter of what does a tourist know when they come here and what can they see when they get here. And there's a lot of pride involved here. It's not just, hey, let's go get tourists and have them spend money in our hotels. That's a goal. But on the other hand, we have a sort of a pride in El Paso. We would like other people to know who we are and where we've been and what we do. And so that, I think, is really what drives the local people to want to tell others about us. They, some of them may be interested in bringing in tourist dollars, but most of them are just have a really cool idea about, hey, El Paso is really great. Look what we did or what we have been doing. And I think that's kind of part of it. The Heritage Tourism Summit is to focus and organize, let's say, the, <clears throat> the industry of, of hotel industry into looking at our history as a tourist attraction. So if we get the whole hotel industry understanding our history, they'll say to a tourist when they show up, did you know about this? Did you know about that? But on the other hand, you've got to realize that what we have is actually better history than most places in North America. So we might as well push it. We might as well use it. And that's one thing that we're going to do with the summit is to focus those energies and efforts and show people how to do that. That's wonderful. You know, and in this short amount of time, you've already gone over so much El Paso history you know, from uh, the Spaniards to the, the indigenous people that lived here, you know, and I know that as a journalist, it might be difficult to kind of isolate a part of history. If you could, you know, what is your favorite part of El Paso's history? What do you feel is the most transformative event that's happened here that really formed, uh, without it, would not have formed who we are today? One thing that happened in El Paso to solidify the area as a major crossroads of people and information was the coming of the railroads in 1881. Up until then, this had been a bit of a sleepy, dusty town, a bit of a mining town, not much real commerce going on, because people who got here either walked, rode a horse, or came in a, in a uh, stagecoach. When the trains arrived, all of a sudden, everything on every coast and every other major city was accessible all of a sudden in El Paso. They mm-hmm. could bring in lumber to build houses. We never had that before. All of our houses were adobe. We, they could bring in the gambling and, the, and the, the loose women and all that kind of activity that goes with it. That rolled into El Paso in 1881 and began 30 years of us being the old Wild West. And we were the wildest of the Old West. So the, the trains is maybe the first and major formative change on a large scale but the changes it brought were, were huge. It changed the building industry. It changed the uh, everything about the, the area. It changed the, the commerce. It changed the construction. It changed the manufacturing. It changed everything where you could get goods to market from El Paso. Where in the past you had to sell whatever you had just locally. Now you could create international industries. Because, see, these railroads also went straight into Mexico. So 1881 would have been the formative event of El Paso history that majorly changed everything here. Now, also, the train history all by itself is fascinating. We have mm-hmm. trains and museums here of trains and transportation, and those are things to look at that are fascinating. Also, the military history, because as the settlers began to come to El Paso, 
They then also brought the military with them to protect themselves against the native uh, population who did not want them here. They, this, this is prime Apache territory. So if you look at the Old West and where were the Apaches, they were right here. And they came down from New Mexico. They came up from Old Mexico. And a lot of times they came to El Paso, as I put it, to do their shopping. Although, frankly, they did it at gunpoint or spear point. So they would come and raid El Paso. And then when that started happening a whole lot, then El Paso went, so, well, we need the military. So then came the military, a series of forts that came right up along the border and up, up into New Mexico and across Arizona to California. That began to, to define the boundary of the southern United States. And then they, they started doing major land purchases. So all of those activities occurred kind of after the trains came. And as you see, the trains now are still here. They're still doing many, many uh, trains a day in commerce through El Paso. So that's the biggest thing that you can say one thing. But it brought so many different things. And now and now we can look at them and, and appreciate them. One other aspect of El Paso you need to understand is the geography and the geology. Because we are very different from most any places around. That's another reason this is different. Because of the mm-hmm. geology and the geography, the Rio Grande River comes through here. And because of that, you get the people. And then because of the gold rushes in 1880, 1840s, 1850s, that's when the uh, east to west traffic began. So the huge crossroads of El Paso was really highlighted in the 1800s. And today, it's a major crossroads for commerce because of its history. It still is. I agree. The El Paso Museum of History has a very interesting exhibit on the railroad and its beginning and its subsequent development and how it's really transformed this area. I agree. You know, uh, it's so wonderful to see that El Paso has become really such an epicenter and was such an epicenter of, of commerce and how that's really formed who we are today. Well, to your question about heritage tourism, you see, you and I know that because we're here. What we're trying to do with the Heritage Tourism Summit is to gear up and figure out how to promote us to other people. Now, I realize that's a major function of, of several groups within the, uh, the El Paso City government. What we'd sure. like to do is to help them because I don't think that maybe the full depth of the history is totally understood by people who are trying to promote it. So what we're doing here is a public-private partnership, which is perfect. Because we as the private people have been looking into the history for years. And as the population of El Paso looks at its own history and says, yeah, that's who we are, we can then word of mouth promote to our relatives and neighbors, come visit, look at our history. But then the the official arm of the city will have the right ammunition to go out there and tell the people what is important to come see here. I'm so glad you see it that way. And it's very true, you know, um, you folks are people who have... A uh, complete passion for the history and everything that El Paso has been and what it will be. And so, we're, you know, we're really looking forward to bringing everybody together at the summit on, on March 22nd. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, you sharing the story about the railroads. I think a lot of people might not have known that. You know, and on a final note, you know, I'd really like uh, to get some tips out there or maybe some additional methods that our listeners can become more immersed in El Paso's history. Well, the, the history of El Paso has been written about. It's been We've been putting it into television programs for the last 15 years, and it is something you can probably learn if you come to the summit. Because what we've done, we've invited everyone in El Paso who has any history venue, whether they're a state park or a museum, whoever they are, if they have an interest and if they're in a capacity to help explain El Paso history, come to the summit and, and take a booth. We're, we're uh, renting booths at a very little rate just to get people in there. And if that will be a location where the general public can come see pretty much a smorgasbord of what is El Paso history, from Fort Bliss to the archaeology people to the historians on the Mission Trail, everyone is invited to come display on that day at that location. And what we're hoping to do is to have those people network amongst themselves so if they get a tourist and wants to know something, they'll know what to, to send them, where to send them. Mm-hmm. But also mm-hmm. that the general public of El Paso can come look at this, and they can learn what is our history and our heritage, and they can find a way that they can help us promote this. Because this, this, is, this could be and should be also a grassroots thing. We want mom and pop to know enough to say when the kids want to come visit what there is to tell them to, to do. Plus, like I said at the beginning, it's a prideful thing. El Paso's happy 
who we are. We're prideful who we are. And we don't mind sharing our history. And that's one reason that we're doing the El Paso Heritage Tourism Summit on March 22nd, 2014. We want to tell everybody in El Paso what we know, have them tell us what they think is our history, because we don't pretend to know all of it, and then form a plan to ship that out and make other people aware of it. So when they come here, we can have their have them as tourists. There are a number of ways you can find out about El Paso history. To toot my own horn, what I've done is make TV shows about El Paso history for like the last 15 years. We have an online uh, library of shows you can purchase on DVD. We also have another online library. We can just go watch uh, lectures and history uh, segments for free. The one where you buy the DVDs is ephistory.com. And we have uh, a lot of old, uh, interesting stories told in a new way, from the legends of El Paso's mountains to gunfights of the Old West. We talk about the geology of the El Paso area. There's a special on Waco tanks. They took down a smelter stack a few months back. We did a video on that. Uh, we have a visitor's guide in there for if you just want to generally know what, what is in the area. And uh, there's a lot of explanations about El Paso history that are right and heritage that are right there at ephistory.com. The other thing we do, uh, I'm a host and producer of a radio program each week, and it's a live program. It's a call-in, and it's called the El Paso History Radio Show. And it's a unique item because there's not too many cities that have a Saturday morning primetime radio program on their history. We have so much history, we almost demanded a radio show. And what we do on the program, it's now online. It's on KTSM AM 690. Anyone can find it on iHeartRadio across the planet. And we talk about the various subjects that come up on the history of El Paso. And it's varied. We go into detail of the things. We have people, we had a guy who was an expert on bottles. And he found all the El Paso breweries and bottle makers and put that into a story. We put that on the air. We have Sam Donaldson on. He's an El Paso native. And he was an ABC correspondent for years on the network. We had him come in and tell his his perspective on history. And, And the Mission Trail is always on. So we're always talking about history items in El Paso. And again, that's 10 a.m. on Saturday morning, uh, mountain time, to noon. And it's on KTSM AM 690 and broadcast and online on iHeartRadio. Thanks again for tuning in to the Visit El Paso podcast, History Vault. Make sure to subscribe to our show on SoundCloud, MixCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher Radio. Also, make sure to stay tuned for next week for our first Music Monday mixtape.